Good morning and welcome to the Morning Devo with Boo. Super excited to be in this chapter this morning and really excited just to be with you all on the Morning Devo. And these are Morning Devos where we go through the Bible in a very simple way, hopefully a very thoughtful way as well, just an applicable way to our lives. You can always check out the archive Bible books that we've gone through at my YouTube channel at Bo Willette. And it is ice hockey season, so super excited about that. Most of you guys know that I am a big hockey guy and enjoy it. So uh, uh, be praying for all the players in the leagues, and uh, that's that's kind of what I do and, and love to uh, be able to uh, hopefully minister to them as well. Hey, you guys saw the poll that I put up this morning. Do you think John is a good place to have people start reading the Bible? So I'll keep that up for a little bit and then I'll cut it out here um, so that it doesn't bother you too much as we're going into the Devo. We're in John chapter 12, an amazing glorious passage. One of my favorite passages of the Bible is in this chapter. So I'm pretty geeked up to go through it with you. I remember Stevie Lou's barbecue out in Rockport, Texas. I've done some devos from out there, wonderful place as well. So here we go. We're going to get into this devo six days before the Passover celebration began. So we are getting close already in the book of John to Jesus' last night um, before the crucifixion. So John, uh, unlike the other Gospels, really hones in on a long last week of Jesus's, um, uh, if you will, uh, time before the cross. And uh, so when you're reading the book of John, 
you kind of get into this chapter 12 section and then you keep going and you're in, you're already in the last week if you will of Christ so it's not like a um, it, it just hones in on a certain really time frame of the life of Christ. Now remember, John's writing this this gospel to help people know who Christ is, um, that he is God in human flesh. Jesus repeats this over and over and over again by quoting passages of the Bible that talk about Yahweh um, teaching the people and being there with the people and and Jesus equates himself with the Father in so many different ways that people uh, are super upset at him and uh, thinking that they're asking them to uh, worship an idol, to break the commandments of God. And that is not so. Jesus is not asking them to break the commandments of God. He's telling him them that uh, this is what the scriptures foretold, that the Messiah would come. It would be the strong arm of the Lord. The Son of Man would come, this Redeemer that would not only be this Redeemer, a servant of God, but also in a real way be God in human flesh. So six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany again at the house of Lazarus. So we remember that, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Isn't that cool? How, how would you like to do that, have a dinner, and Jesus was going to come over your pad and hang out and chill out? I mean, what would you do? How clean would your house get? I mean, what, what kind of person are you? Now, we're going to see two people kind of having these different ideas at what to do when Jesus is coming over to your, your place. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made of e essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrant fragrance. So this beautiful sacrificial aroma is smelled throughout the house, of course, because she dumps a huge 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume. We'll see just how much this was, but I just want you to catch the really cool applicable part of this section. You know, Mary, Mary, uh, Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate uh, with him, and Mary takes this, this offering and brings it before the Lord. And there's kind of different people doing different things. You know, I wonder what I would do if Jesus was coming over my house. You know, what would you be doing if Jesus was coming over your house? You know, what do you think you guys would be doing? Um, hey, hey, Zeus, it's good to see you in the house, man. We hope you're doing well and ready to go, man. So, yeah, think about that. Jesus coming over your house. And it says, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. Can you imagine that? That perfume was that expensive, a year's wage. And it should have been sold the money and the money given to the poor, which sounds great, right? Sometimes I say things that sound, you know, so pious, so religious, you know, but what's really in my heart? Not that he cared for the poor, verse 6 says, he was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Man, where's my heart? You know, Judas Iscariot was an administrator, and I, I got to tell you, I'm an administrator. And so I look at this and I go, man, dude, this could be me, no doubt, stealing, you know, pocketing some of that cash. Um, you know, having that idea of like, oh, you know, man, why do we spend it there? We could have done this with it. Oh, my heart can go those directions. And, and, and that's the evil of the heart. Um, now, um, this is the heart of this man, Judas Iscariot. And we have to really always be aware that we too have these kind of, uh, inclinations, it's called the in Hebrew the Yetzer Hara, the sinful inclination, right? To go south, to bend. Why do we say south anyway? Go north, right? Maybe go north, right? North is the bad, south is the good. You know, let's switch that thing, 
right? Um, yeah. Why is South always got to be the bad? How about the North be the bad? Anyway, um, it says not that he cared for the poor, right? He didn't really care for the poor. His heart was just bent, right? He was tweaked. And Jesus replied, leave her alone. Isn't that cool? Leave her alone. Man, he said that out loud. He said what he said out loud. You know, it should have been sold and given to the poor. You know, we could have done better with that money than give a whole year's wage. Seems like such a foolish thing, right, to spend all that money, you know. But, you know, and, and man, you could see where, where we can get a little off with this. Sometimes it seems ridiculous. Uh, steps of faith might seem ridiculous. Stepping out in great ways of faith, they might seem odd. They might seem stupid to people. It might seem ridiculous. You know, to those aren't s that aren't seeing the beauty of faith, then it seems wrong. And, you know, when I look at people, am I looking at, hey, they're making decisions on faith, and praise God for that. Even though for me it might seem like monetary-wise they didn't make a wise decision. Like, I, I, could I could really maybe critique it and go, well, did they really go over the numbers? Man, that doesn't seem right at all. Like, God, don't they know they're still spending blah, 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 blah amount? You know, and they could be saving money and da, 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 da. And, and, you know, and, you know, my brain can go like that. I can really get like that in my, in my mind, in my head, you know. And I have to back up and just go, well, do these people do it out of faith? Are they trusting God? You know, are they walking in faith when they make their decisions? And the answer usually, you know, is yeah. You know, they, they, they're they making their decisions, trusting God, and they're happy, happy as a clam in a sense in the Lord, man. They love the Lord, and they're making decisions in Christ. And, you know, I and, and at that point, you have to go, hey, you know, leave them alone. <laughs> That's right. Did she not, uh, she did this in preparation for my burial. This offering is in preparation uh, for his burial. There was something Jesus saw in the offering of Mary, of this ointment, this perfume, that symbolized something of the offerings that the Jewish people were familiar with. The idea of incense, the idea of perfume, the idea of aroma, the idea of preparation, the idea of a beautiful sacrifice, the idea of being lift, uh, that uh, the, our prayers are being uh, rising um, up as a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. All these pictures, if you will, all these pictures were in the faith of Mary and what she did. And he says, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Some people get so focused on humanitarian efforts that they forget Jesus. They get so focused on humanitarian efforts that they might have all the humanitarian gusto in the world, but they do not know Christ. And Jesus says, I am the greater you must come to me in order to see everything in its proper value. So when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. And that had to be pretty gnarly, huh? To see Lazarus, that must have been pretty cool. Jesus says, it's awesome when you give a treasure you have and have not uh, and do not have a second thought about it. That's so true, Jesus. It just goes, huh? It's just like a hilarious, happy giving, an enthusiastic giving, you know. So it says, um, the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. Isn't this sad? Now the, now the ruling class, uh, the ruling power that be, the religious ruling power, the government ruling power, uh, can't have Lazarus alive because he's a testimony to the power and the person and the work of Jesus of Nazareth. So check this out. Lazarus is raised from the dead by Jesus and now he's now his life is being sought after by by the by the ruling class. For it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. So the power is being stripped away from the leadership and that's what people struggle with is when power is being diminished, then, um, you know, you get upset so much that you will kill 
you will kill people to gain and to stay in power. This has happened repeatedly in history right here in verse in chapter 12, verse 10. Um, over and over and over again in human history, this has been our lot. Um, this has been our testimony as human beings. We want power so much, we will take life for it. And it says, the next day, the news that Jesus went on his way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a colt, a donkey's colt. The disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus, Jesus entered into his glory, meaning kind of his resurrection, if you will, his glory, right, this glorious period of Jesus' life, um, or I should say his resurrected life, it says that um, um, then they realized the things that have been written about him. So we get a little verse 16, like a little John puts in this little like, hey man, when this happened, we didn't really realize the fulfillment of the scriptures that was taking place. And always remember, Christianity, or it, let's say it this way, the New Testament writers are always showing how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So many in the crowd had seen Jesus <clears throat> call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason when so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Now, all these towns are tiny. I'm from a, uh, a, a small town in a big area, if you can believe it. So, you know, within Los Angeles proper, Ventura County proper, you have a lot of people. But within those areas, you have your little neighborhoods, you know, your little towns that you're in. And you kind of know everybody in those little towns. And you kind of, but what if someone rose from the dead within your town? I mean, man, dude, that would be a mind blower. And so there's a lot of hype going on. And so everybody's coming out. And the Pharisees, what do they say? Verse 19, they say to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Now desperation comes when power structures feel that their power is being threatened. They have to go to another level to try to create fear in people, coerce people into obedience. So when power structures feel that they're losing their power, they need to do something, and that is they need to instill some kind of fear. They need to make some kind of statement. Someone needs to be an example. They need to make someone an example to put people back in the place of obedience, right? It's like a parent who is so selfish that when they feel like they're not being respected properly according to way, the way they think they need to be respected, they get angry all the time in the house. Well, you're not respecting me. You're not respecting me. Why aren't you respecting me? I, need, I deserve respect. I work all day. I, you know, that kind of attitude, right? Um, you know, where wh why would I want to respect you? All you do is complain about not getting respect. Um, but then they start, then they up the ante and they start, you know, not only doing verbal things, but they start making people an example. They start putting, you know, doing physical violence maybe or, um, you know, tr uh, putting people, uh, grounding your kids all the time and, you know, it's things like that. And it's like to show you're powerful, to show you're the one in charge. You know, we've seen this happen over and over in our lives, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And it says some Greeks who had come from Jerusalem, meaning just normal Greek people, Gentile people, non-Jewish people, who had come to Jerusalem from the Passover celebration, paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they w went to, uh, together to ask Jesus. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of, the, of a wheat 
of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. Now, this is something that is beautiful. And this is something that's so applicable and something we can contemplate all day long. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Now, what is Jesus saying? These Greeks want to come to him. They, they're so excited about the miracles, man. They want to see that. And what does Jesus say? I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, I am going to die. It remains alone. I remain all alone, just one, one in, you know, one person, if you will, all by myself, but its death will produce many new kernels. But if I die, there will be a production of me all over the place. Jesus is saying, when I die, there is going to be a multiplication of Jesus's, and meaning a multiplication of the testimonies, the multiplication of the, the people of God, um, a plentiful harvest of new lives are going to be happening through this one kernel of wheat that is planted in the soil and die. Isn't that cool? Maybe I need to die to myself so that it can produce something far greater in many more people. Maybe I need to die to my selfishness, to my wants, in order to think of others t so that there is a plentiful harvest of new lives that flow out of my life. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. <clears throat> Let me repeat that. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Why? Because they, you are holding on to everything in this life. This life is all you got. That's all you're seeing. And this is what the, the, the leaders of Jesus' day were seeing. They were looking at things through the flesh, through this world's lens. This is it. This is what we got. This is what we got to hold on to. If you love your life in this world, you will truly lose your life. You will lose everything you were meant to be. Those who care nothing for this life in this world will keep it for eternity. Let me repeat that. Those who care nothing for this life in this world will keep it for eternity. So if I want eternity, then there needs to be a hating of certain things, a not caring um, for the life in this world. Not caring, not in the sense of, of blase, blase, I don't want to help my family kind of thing. I don't care about you. Nothing like that. But there needs to be a necessary hating of things in the, this life in comparison to the loving of the spiritual. If I love the spiritual, if I love God, if I love the things of God, the things that I can't see, right, then I will have a proper value for the things on this earth. But if I care only for the things I can see, then I will lose out on all the things that I cannot see, including eternity. Now, there's a lot to talk about there, but I want you to just read that again, that dying to self. Jesus says, hey, these people want to see me. That's great, you know, but I got to tell you, when I go down, when I die and I go into the soil, I am going to produce something. And boy, I see that and uh, that I need that too. I need to, in order for me to produce something, I need to go down into the soil. Right? I need to be focused on the mission, a spiritual mission, uh, those kind of things, in order to really truly benefit other people. Anybody who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. Meaning if Jesus is going into the ground, then guess where I need to go into? The ground as well. I need to go into the ground. I need to follow him into death, and, and I'll follow him into resurrection too. Wow. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Man, so Jesus is breaking it down. But my soul is deeply troubled, should I pray? Now, these things go so against human nature, man. He is just giving it. This is why Jesus is such a profound teacher. Because he cuts through the human pride and arrogance. Just in such short sentences. But my soul is deeply troubled, should I pray? Father, save me from this hour. But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. What was Jesus' focus? What is my focus this morning? 
bring glory to your name. Isn't that cool? Yeah, what is the best motivation to do anything? What is the best motivation to do anything? You know what it is? Anybody? What is the best motivation? It's the glory of God. That's it. It's the glory of God. And so this is what Jesus says. And then he says, then a voice spoke from heaven saying, so when Jesus says this, there is this amazing, amazing voice that comes out that says, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. So what does the father respond? I'm going to be glory. I'm going to be bring glory to my name. What is what is the father doing in the life of the son? He is bringing glory to himself. He is bringing glory to the Father through the work of the Son. See, many people can really diss God because God has not really judged mankind deservingly as they should be judged. And a lot of people criticize one person in particular, and that person's Satan throughout the Bible. Satan's always dissing God because God uh, is... uh, you know, been merciful to human beings. Yeah, very merciful uh, in light of our rebellion against God. And um, and so, you know, Jesus is going to bring glory to the Father. Uh, God's name will be exalted once again uh, as just, as righteous. This kind of idea is going on. So there's a lot of spiritual things going on. And... Um, And so in verse 29, it says, When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Very interesting when you study the book of uh, Revelation, you see that when voices like this from heavenly voices happen, thunder, uh, sound of thunder, right? So it's kind of a neat parallel. Verse 30, Then Jesus told them, The voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. Very interesting. So a lot's going on spiritually. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. And he said this to indicate how he was going to die. Being lifted up from the earth, put on the cross, right? Like put up right above, in between heaven and earth, Jesus would sit. He would be the ladder between heaven and earth he would be lifted up from the earth in between the heavens and the earth very interesting picture right the crowd responded we understand from scripture that the messiah would live forever how can you say the son of man will die so now people are starting to uh listen to jesus's bible studies but they're getting a little nervous because jesus keeps referring to this death that he's going to have and they ask him how can you say the son of man's going to die Just who is this son of man anyway? And Jesus replied, my light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light as you can so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. um, Then you will become children of the light. Very cool, children of the light. Paul picks up on that in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. You could always read that, Ephesians chapter 4. After saying these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, hey, you guys know what's going to happen, right? All the miraculous signs Jesus done, how is people going to respond? Most of the people did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? The arm is Jesus. He is the 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 arm of the Lord, the strong arm of the Lord. That's what Isaiah in the Old Testament, 700 years or 600 years before Christ, is uh, referring to. And so, but the people cannot believe, for Isaiah also said, the Lord has blinded their eyes, hardened their hearts, so their eyes cannot see and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and have me heal them. There is a stubbornness within Indi- within the nation of Israel, and there is a hardening that has taken effect. So John gives us a little commentary here on those Bible passages. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this, because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. 
Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders. Whoa, so some of the Jewish leaders, some of the hegemony is starting to believe in Jesus, this ruling class. And it says, but they wouldn't admit it for the fear of the Pharisees that would expel him from the synagogue. To be expelled from the synagogue was a pretty major deal back then. And so they had some fear of the leadership, and they were leaders themselves, so they stayed silent. That's what fear does in our life. Fear in my life could do a lot of things, and one of the things it can do is make me remain silent, right? Why do we not stand up? Maybe it's because of fear. That's why. Hmm, just a thought. Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. Wow, that's awesome. I have come as the light to shine in the dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me. For I have come to save the world and not to judge it. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. And it says, I don't speak on my own authority. My father who sent me has commanded me to say what what, say and, and what to say and how to say it. And I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the father tells me to say. There's a lot of good gems in there as well. Don't you just love what Jesus is saying, though? Man, come to me. You won't walk in darkness anymore. You'll have a new set of eyes. You'll see things differently through a different lens. You got different perspectives on things. All of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you just, you look at the world in such a different way. But when you reject my message, there's already something you're missing out on. There's already a judgment that has come against you. You're already now enabled to see things properly. Your value systems are, are you don't see them right. You, you now are living in, in a sen- sense, uh, a, a shadow land, a dark land, right? A darkness. Um, and, um, and he says, come to me. You can trust me. Everything the Father says tells me what to say, how to say it, I, I do. And uh, it says, for when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. When you see me, you are seeing the Father. You are seeing him in action. Wow. Very cool. You want to know God? This is what Jesus has come to do, is reveal the r- reveal God. So really cool. I could come to Jesus, and Jesus is always that person who's going to help me understand the Father and the Father's will for my life. You know, if ever I get confused and go, man, how do, what does God really want from me? I could always look to Jesus. I could always read about Jesus. I could always go into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and read about Jesus. And, I, and then I know what the Father's will for me is. I can get it right from Jesus. And the first thing the Father would want me to do is to believe in the Son, is to trust in the Son, to lean the ideas, to lean my life onto the Son, to uh, lean on Him for everything. You know, put all my weight on Him. Trust Him. So, man, what another great passage of Scripture. John chapter 12, a lot of gems in there. Hazy says, our mediator. Um, and Marcia said she had it run. So, um, and, um, so I hope you guys have a great one. It's so good having you in the house of Devo. You guys take care. Have a great weekend, okay? Bye-bye.